has got to go the length of the court with 2.5 left. Sykes, long pass. Bill Jenkins shoots me for the win. Go! Everybody will have like two or three moments in their life that sort of will always be like it was yesterday and like you remember it so vividly and you remember every single detail um, and that was from about the last 30 seconds of that game throughout the next like week I can remember almost every single thing that happened in my life and it was kind of crazy. The view that the photographer got that took the picture that turned into the poster was exactly the view that I had because I was standing right next to him when he took the picture. And then we both just ran down the aisle and just started high-fiving everybody on the bench that, that we could. Um, and uh, that was remarkable. It had a big impact on my life, just this simple basketball play, Valpo wins a game, and here I am today, in all likelihood, because he made that shot. Valparaiso University makes its home in a town with a population of 33,000 people. There are only 4,500 students every year, both graduate and undergraduate. It lies in northwest Indiana, 50 miles southeast of Chicago, and 150 miles north of Indianapolis. Most people have never heard of it, but those who have tend to associate it with one thing, basketball. The history of basketball at Valpo dates back over a hundred years. Many students participated in interclass competitions and the law school even had its own team. In 1917, construction on a gymnasium was completed, allowing Valpo to create and compete with a varsity team. Many of those once a part of the law school basketball team became varsity players. An impassioned student wrote to the torch, let us hope that when at last we have games, that they are games and contests in every sense of the word, and that no one team will be allowed to walk away with the pennant that would destroy the spirit. After the gymnasium was built, the team competed independently until 1951, when it joined the Indiana Collegiate Conference, a Division II conference under coach Sonny Allen. But before that, came a very special group of players known as the world's tallest team. What's interesting about the world's tallest team is that um, that was early on in the presidency of O.P. Kretzman and I think O.P. Kretzman realized that one of the best ways to um, to broaden the um, the reach of the university was to have that team and then to send them around the country. So I don't, I don't know if people appreciate that, that, that they traveled around the United States. Um, at that point it would be primarily the, we, um, the Midwest and the, and the East Coast, um, really kind of promoting the school. So everybody's seen the iconic shot of them in front of Madison Square Garden, but they played games in Boston Garden, they played games um, um, all over the country. They played teams from Canada. Um, so it was very much a, an effective way for the university to um, get its name out nationally and, and, get, and be known. So I think O.P. Kretzman was kind of ahead of his time. That's a wonderful legacy when you see that team and, and when you um, hear about some of the, the people that were on there, Schoon and Dilly, and, um, and just hear their Velpo stories. It's really, um, I think it, it exemplifies what the Velpo experience is. The 1940s, this is a team, the world's tallest team, traveled all over the U.S ended up on armed forces and newsreels. I mean, that's, I mean, not just nationally, internationally, you got soldiers on bases all over the world watching film on the Valparaiso University men's basketball team. And, you know, there's the iconic photo even today of the world's tallest team outside Madison Square Garden, which I think is the image everyone associates with the world's tallest team and something we were lucky enough to be able to recreate a few years back when we went to MSG for the, uh, the NIT Final Four.
made up of men too tall to enlist or become a part of the draft in World War II. The world's tallest team brought a large amount of attention to a small town in Indiana and put Valparaiso on the map of college basketball for the first time. Their success lay less in their record each year and more in their ability to bring awareness to their school and celebrate basketball during a time of war in the United States. After the world's tallest team, the Crusaders found mixed success as a Division II school and rarely made it past a 500 season. On those rare occasions that they did, they found ways to appear in the Division II NCAA tournament five different times under coaches Paul Meadows, Gene Bartow, and Bill Pruden. Gene Bartow in particular led the Crusaders to great Division II success. He coached the team to three different Division II NCAA tournament appearances, highlighted by an Elite Eight appearance in 1967. Following their appearance in the 1973 NCAA tournament under Bill Pruden, Valparaiso struggled to find any real success for the next 20 years. There were no finishes better than second place, and after turning Division I in 1978, the Crusaders had losing seasons for 14 straight years. And then there were the Drews. For the university and for the basketball program and for the Drews, um, it was a culmination of this long road where Homer took a program that was awful. And in his first three seasons, he won a grand total of 13 games. Not 13 games in one year, but 13 games in his first three years. Um, and then he brought back two local kids, Casey Schmidt and Dave Redman, and that was the start of Valpo basketball, really. I mean, there was great moments back to Gene Bartow and, and the world's tallest team and so many things in, in the history of Valpo basketball. But the start of Valpo basketball as we know it was when Homer Drew convinced two local kids, Dave Redman and Casey Schmidt, to come back and to turn the whole program around. And then they won 12 games, and then they won 20 games, and then they won 20 or more every year since. And I think not only, obviously there's a great chance Bryce Drew would have gone to Valpo, whether the team had been winning six or seven games, but if Valpo hadn't turned it around in those couple seasons when the local kids came back, then I don't know if Homer Drew would still have been the head coach. And if Homer Drew's not the head coach, then Bryce Drew doesn't come, obviously, to play basketball at Valpo. And if Bryce doesn't come, then the shot never happens. It, it, it was very much of a family. Um, and in the first couple of years, Homer was the coach. When you go 5-22, and 4-22, and 4-22, and, and you're last place in the conference, um, and that it takes a little... Uh, you, you have to be a good family uh, when that happens. And then we started turning it around, and um, I think it was it's, uh, certainly a legacy, and there's, there's a reason it's called Homer Drew Court. Homer Drew took the helm of Valpo basketball in 1988. In the first five years of Homer Drew's tenure as head coach, the Crusaders experienced some of the worst records in the team's history, going 4-24, and 5-22, and 22, and 5-22 and 22 in three straight seasons. Homer's son, Scott Drew, joined the staff as an assistant in 1993, and together they convinced two local boys, Casey Schmidt and David Redmond, to return to Valparaiso. From there, the Crusaders took off, and in 1994, Bryce Drew arrived at Valpo. I remember when I first saw him play, it was, he was in ninth grade, um, playing in a JV game, and he was honestly no more than 105 or 110 pounds. He was about five foot seven, um, by the end of the year, he was playing varsity basketball. I just thought, here's a kid who really understands how to play and can really shoot and understands exactly what to do on the basketball court. Um, but by the time Bryce, I think, was about a junior in high school, you could see that here is a kid who is going to be, if he comes to Valpo, the best player in school history. I mean, I thought that, watching him as a junior in high school, that he probably will become the best player in Valpo University history if he ends up going there. And I'll never remember, I'll never forget the moment. Scott and I were sitting next to each other on, on a bus ride back from Milwaukee. And all the town talked about was, is Bryce gonna stay home and go to Valpo? And he didn't announce it throughout his senior season. And it was about halfway through the senior season, I said, all right, what's the latest with Bryce? because he had taken visits to Syracuse and Stanford. You know, I'm like, what's the latest? And he said, 
I think you know how close we are as a family. I think that's all you need to know when I said that. Well, that's what I figured. And I knew at that moment, and I never really said it to anybody, and it was never announced until April that Bryce was going to Valpo. He just wanted to enjoy his senior year of high school, which was kind of an historic year. They went undefeated, went to the state championship game before losing it overtime. He won Mr. Basketball. Um, but his talent was obvious from very early on. The Crusaders found great success for the next three years, but couldn't push past the first round of the NCAA tournament. And then something miraculous happened. I knew about that shot. Everybody in the country knew about that shot, um, especially if you knew about basketball. I mean, that was the shot. Um, you know, every year you know about a shot, but that was one of the biggest ever. And so, yeah, I knew about it, and it was a very exciting in, in my household. My mom was making sure I knew about the shot. And I, I t would tell Bryce later, I was like, you know that shot, it, it, it impacted your life a little bit, but it changed mine. And it's, it's so interesting to think that one small basketball play could set my life uh, you look at the little moments of, in your life that change things, and I can 100% point to that moment as a defining moment for me, despite the fact that when it happened, there was, I, I, you know, we jumped around, we ran around, we drank Mountain Dew, we ate popcorn, and we moved on to the next game. Didn't know at the time that 18-year-old version of me was going to have my life altered by a three-point shot. In 1998, Valparaiso again appeared in the NCAA tournament facing off against a much higher seeded Ole Miss team. With five seconds left and the Crusaders chasing two points, Bryce Drew missed a three-pointer, forcing Valpo to foul Ole Miss and send Ansu Cisse to the free throw line. He missed and the ball went out of bounds. Possession, Valpo. By Jamie Sykes, Carter pressuring. It's to Jenkins, the Drew for the win! Good! Oh! He did it! Bryce Drew did it! Valpo has won the game! A miracle! I remember in my mind thinking his career can't end like this. His career cannot end with a missed shot like that. Um, but you know, it was kind of like that was Bryce Drew. Valpo went on to defeat Florida State in the next round, but eventually was eliminated from the tournament by Rhode Island. Despite not winning the tournament, Bryce Drew shot and the Crusaders' run through the Sweet 16 solidified Valpo's place in basketball excellence. After spending time in the NBA, Bryce followed in his brother and father's footsteps and returned to Valparaiso as a coach. He led the Crusaders to two NCAA tournaments and two NIT tournaments during his time in charge. In 2014, his jersey was retired alongside Bruce Lindner, who also wore number 24 for Valpo. Bryce Drew eventually left the Crusaders to coach at Vanderbilt, but leaves behind a legacy that can be seen where his retired jersey still hangs 
inside the Athletics Recreation Center. It's an amazing thing, clearly. Um, just the, the whole storyline, um, Bryce's shot in the play and, and the whole storyline of a son playing for his father and the, the fact that it comes up all the time and resonates with people. It's just a wonderful story. So uh, clearly a, a, um, a significant piece of our Velpo history um, and a significant, significant piece of the um, basketball's history. Um, but I always tell people one piece one piece that is, it's like one piece in a hundred year history, but clearly the piece that people um, at this point would, would um, see the most often and, and most people would know. The post Drew era began with a familiar face to many Valpo fans in the hiring of Matt Loddick. After serving as an assistant coach under Bryce Drew, Loddick was elevated to the role of head coach upon Bryce's departure to Vanderbilt. What he's done is, 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 is really amazing to me, is he took over for the most legendary person in Valpo basketball history. In the first year he took over it, we went and won the league. And with our top player injured, and we won games at the end to secure the league, went to the NIT. Then the biggest jump Valpo's ever made was in his second year, and it's to the Missouri Valley where you have guys like Ben Jacobson who's been a head coach for 12 years and had been to the Sweet 16. and competing down to the wire in every game. And we have a team that we recruited to win in the Horizon League, where we can be more athletic, we can run up and down the court, we can pound the ball inside. You know, necessarily shooting isn't as important because we're gonna play such good defense, we're gonna get on the break and we do those things. When, then we move to the Valley, not knowing that we're gonna move to the Valley. Like most teams have times of prayer, prepare recruiting every year to what league they're in. Well, we've had to shift that. So the job he's done is, is to me is tremendous. And it's, it, it's gonna, it could take time. We don't want it to take time, but the, the character he brings to the program, the level of enthusiasm he brings to the program, the amount of time he spends um, meeting with, with alums and donors and, and building the brand of Alpo basketball, is 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 really time consuming and he does a great job at it. You know Matt had been in the system for three years. Um, Matt and I had become friends and close and I'd really come to really respect his knowledge and um, you know I was one of the people who kind of pushed for Matt Loddick to be head coach and you know I think he'll do great things um, and I know things have not gone the way a lot of Alpo fans have wanted. Um, but I have faith that he's going to turn things around and and um, I just think It's only a matter of time before you know Matt starts winning at, at a very high level here at Valpo Loddick's first year as head coach was incredibly successful as he led the Crusaders to a conference championship within the Horizon League and a berth in the NIT in 2017 Valparaiso moved from the Horizon League to the Missouri Valley Conference where his struggle to find the success of the Drew years. Despite struggling against tougher competitors in the Missouri Valley Conference, which ranks among the most challenging mid-major conferences nationally on a yearly basis, Matt Loddick's coaching tenure has had no shortage of excitement. Loddick led Valpo alum Alec Peters through his senior year, during which Peters ranked nationally in scoring and rebounding, and shattered five school records, including the career points record previously held by Bryce Drew. Peters went on to play for the Phoenix Suns for a season and now competes professionally overseas. In 2019, Valpo fans were treated to another breathtaking buzzer beater on a half-court heave from Marcus Golder. It's no good. Golder the rebound. And he's going to get it off for half-court. And he scores! And Valpo wins! Marcus Golder for half-court! You gotta be bleeping me! And the Crusaders have won the game! We've had a unique set of circumstances in the three years he's been coach. Um, a number of things um, have happened that don't um, haven't happened in the past. A number of things that have kind of come together. Um, um, the timing of which has been interesting to see, and I think he's handled those really well. Um, one thing that's important to us is, is that we're trying to take the big picture. We, we have to take the big picture um, when I got here in 2004 um, about as we've changed leagues, um, what does that transition mean, what are the things we need to do, and a lot of those things can't happen like right away, they can't happen in a year or two. 
Um, our move to the Missouri Valley was a much bigger step up competition-wise than our move from the Midcon to the Horizon League. So that transition is going to take a little bit of time, and it's going to have to happen the right way. Um, and um, Matt Lodick is doing it the right way. Um, he's doing it um, in, the, in a manner that, that we here at the university feel good about. So we just need to let that play out and let that have the right amount of time. Um, and um, two years is, is, is a really short period when you're trying to make a transition like that. And um, so I think he's doing a good job. I think he's the right person for the job. Um, I anticipate he'll be here for uh, the foreseeable future and that um, people will look back at the transition and say, wow, that was hard, but we're proud of the way that Velpo did it and we're proud of the fact that they got to a good place and they did it the right way. Velpo has seen many changes in its more than 100 year history. Each year brings new changes, new opportunities, and new players eager to add to an already rich culture of basketball at Valparaiso University. I think the, the, the future's bright. Um, I'm excited about it. I, I do believe we will have success in the Missouri Valley Conference. I do believe we'll have success under Matt Lodick. Um, and um, I do believe that uh, you'll see us in the tournament. Um, again, hopefully in the next couple of years. And at that point, um, hopefully we've positioned ourselves um, to have a good seed and to have a game that, um, that we can compete in um, and then hopefully we can win. And I think it's just a sense of family. Like you're around and you really feel like you're part of something special and, uh, and it keeps people here for, for quite some time. Uh, to me, Valpo basketball has changed my life. There's, I have so many little fun treasured moments that I'll, I'll keep for myself that are amazing memories but the the totality of it is I've gotten to see and do things that I never would have got a chance to do because one guy hit a three-pointer a long time ago and that family stayed around and built something amazing. Thank you.